Welcome to this series of supply chain lectures. I'm Jean-Nes Vermorel, and today I will be presenting modern computers for supply chain. Western supply chains have been digitalized for a long time, one, two, sometimes three decades ago. Um, Computer-based decisions are everywhere, and the associated numerical recipes goes, uh, go under various names, such as reorder points, min-max inventory, safety stocks, uh, obviously with varying degree, uh, the degrees of human supervision. Nonetheless, if we look at large companies nowadays uh, who operate equivalently large supply chains, we are looking at millions of decisions uh, that are essentially computer driven, that are driving um, the performance of the supply chain. And thus, when it comes to the improvement of um, the supply chain performance, it very quickly boils down to the improvement of the numerical recipes that are driving this whole supply chain. And, uh, and here, invariably, when we start considering you know, superior numerical recipes of any kind, uh, where we want, we are looking for uh, better models, uh, more accurate forecasts, um, invariably, those um, superior recipes end up costing a lot more computing resources. And, um, and uh, however, computing resources have been uh, are, um, uh, a struggle for supply chain. Uh, they cost a lot of money, and um, and there is always, you know, the next stage of evolution for the next model, for the next uh, for the next forecasting system, that just requires, you know, ten times more computing resources than the previous one. Yes, it could bring supply chain performance, extra supply chain performance, but it comes with uh, with increased uh, computing cost. Obviously, uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, computing hardware has been progressing uh, tremendously. But as we, have, we will see today, um, this progress, although it is, it is still progress, uh, it, there is still a, a fair amount of progress, the problem is that very frequently, enterprise software antagonize um, the computing uh, hardware that we have nowadays. And thus, as a result, software doesn't get faster with more modern hardware. On the contrary, as we will see, it can actually very frequently get slower. The goal for this lecture is to instill among the audience uh, some degree of mechanical sympathy so that you can assess the, um, uh, whether a piece of enterprise software that is supposed to implement uh, numerical recipes intended to deliver superior supply chain performance, whether this piece of um, enterprise software embrace uh, the computing hardware as it already exists and as it will exist a decade from now, or does it antagonize and thus um, uh, essentially do not really make the most of the computing hardware that we have today? One of the most puzzling aspects of um, modern computers are the orders, the range of orders of magnitude that are involved. From the supply chain perspective, um, we typically have about five orders of magnitude, and that's already stretching it. Usually it's not even that. Um, so five orders of magnitude means that we can go from one unit to 100,000 units. And remember that's something that was that I discussed in the previous lectures, we have the law of small numbers at play. If you have a large number of units, you're not going, the, you're not going to process those units individually, you're going to pack them into boxes, and thus you will be left with a much smaller number of boxes. Similarly, if you have many boxes, you will pack them into pallets, et cetera, et cetera, so that you have a much smaller number of pallets. Economies of scales induce you know, reductions of quantities, and thus, uh, from um, the supply chain perspective, when we are dealing with flow of, uh, of physical goods, um, a 10% inefficiency tend to be already quite significant. And either when we go into the realm of, um, of computers, it's very different. We are dealing with 15 orders of magnitude, which is absolutely gigantic. It's to go from one unit to one million billions units. The number is so large that it's actually very difficult to visualize. And, um, um, and so we go from uh, one byte. One byte is just uh, essentially eight bits. And uh, one byte in a computer can be used to represent a letter or a digit. And we go from 
elements that are just tiny bits of information that would be just one byte to a petabyte, uh, which is a million gigabytes. And a petabyte is about the order of magnitude of the amount of data that LOCAD presently manage and that, um, that large companies operating large supply chain, I'm not speaking of tech companies, just large companies operating large su supply chains are also operating you know, uh, data sets that are of the order of magnitude of, of one petabyte. And also we, we go from one flop, a flop is a floating point operation per second, to uh, one petaflop, which is uh, one uh, million uh, gigaflops. So that's those, those orders of magnitude are absolutely gigantic and very deceptive. And as a result, in, uh, if in the supply chain realm, 10% uh, of what's considered as being inefficient, what typically happens in the realm of computers is that it's not about being inefficient from 10%. Uh, it's more being inefficient from a factor of 10 and sometimes several orders of magnitude. So if you do something wrong in terms of, of, of performance in the realm of computers, your penalty will not be 10% off. It will be that your system is going to be 10 times slower than it should be, or 100 times, and sometimes 1,000 times slower than it should have been. And that's really what is at stake of having a true alignment, which requires some kind of mechanical sympathy between um, the enterprise software and the underlying computing hardware. When considering um, a numerical recipe that is supposed to deliver some kind of superior supply chain performance, there is a, a set of stages, of maturity stages, that are of interest conceptually. Obviously, your, your millage may vary in practice, but that's typically what we have identified at LOCAD. And, and those, uh, those stages can be um, summarized as make it work, make it right, make it fast, make it cheap. Make it work is about assessing whether you know, a, a, a prototype numerical recipe is really delivering um, the intent. The intent can be higher service levels, uh, less dead stock, a better uh, utilization of the assets, you know, any kind of, 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 uh, of, of, um, of goal that is worthy for, uh, from your supply chain perspective. And, and so the goal is first, to, you have a new numerical so, um, numerical recipe, you have to make sure that it actually worked at the first stage of maturity. Then you have to make it right. And what does that mean from a supply chain perspective? It means that um, you typically need to transform what was essentially a snowflake, you know, a, a unique prototype into something that has um, some uh, production grade quality, you know, production grade quality attached to it. And usually that, that involved attaching to this numerical recipe some degree of correctness by design. Indeed, supply chains are vast, supply chains are complex, and more importantly, supply chains are very, very messy. And thus, if you have a, a numerical recipe that is very, very fragile, you know, where it's, uh, even if the numerical method is kind of good, it's very easy to get it wrong, and then you end up creating, uh, I would say, many times more problems compared to what you were, compared to the sort of, um, of benefits that you intended to bring into the first place, this is not a, a winning proposition. So making it right is to make sure that you have something that, that can be you know, deployed at scale with minimal amount of friction. Then um, you want to make this numerical recipe fast. And when I say fast, I, I mean fast in terms of wall clock. So that when you start the calculation, you can get the results within minutes, maybe an hour or two at most, but no longer. Why? Again, supply chains are messy. Uh, there will be a point of time in the history of your company where there will be you know, container ships stuck in the middle of the Suez Canal, uh, a, a, a pandemic, anything, you know, something that will disrupt your operations, maybe a warehouse getting flooded. Um, and when this happens, you need to be able to react. I'm not saying react in the next milliseconds, but if you have numerical recipes that takes days to complete, it is a massive operational friction. You need things that can be you know, operated within a short, um, let's say, human time frame. And thus, it needs to be fast. And remember, uh, modern um, enterprise software runs on, uh, on clouds. Uh, uh, and you can always pay for more computing resources on the cloud computing platform. Thus, your software can actually be fast just because you are actually uh, 
paying for tons of computing resources. It's not actually that the software itself, although it has to be properly designed so it can leverage all the processing power that uh, a cloud can, uh, can service to you, but essentially it can be fast and very inefficient just because you're, you're renting so much processing power from your cloud computing provider. Uh, and, um, and so the next stage is that to make this method cheap. And by cheap, I mean um, that it doesn't use too much uh, um, cloud computing resources. Because if you, if you don't go into this final stage, it means that you can, you can never improve upon. You know, if you have a method that, is, uh, that works, that is right, that is fast, but uh, where the consumption is very, very high, uh, when you will want to go for the next stage of numerical recipe, you know, the next stage which invariably will involve something that is um, that costs even more computing resources than what you are currently doing, uh, you will be stuck. You will be stuck because you're already uh, spending, I would say, way too much computing resources. So you need to basically make the method that you have super, super lean so that um, you can start try, uh, playing again with uh, numerical recipes that happen to be you know, a lot more inefficient than what you currently have. Um, and, that's, that's, and that's for this last stage where you really need um, to embrace uh, the underlying hardware that, that is available in modern computers. You can make do with the first three maturity stage without too much, uh, too much affinity, but the last one is really the key. And remember, if you don't get to the make it cheap, then you don't get to iterate and so you're stuck. So that's, that's why even if it's the last stage, this is an iterative game. And it is very, very important to go through all the stages if you want to be able to, uh, to play repeated iteration. Now, hardware is progressing. Um, and, from, uh, and it looks like an exponential progression. But the reality is that this uh, exponential progression of, um, of computing hardware is actually made up of thousands of S-curves. So an S-curve is essentially you know, a curve where you introduce um, a new design, a new, pro uh, a new process, a new material, a new architecture. And initially, it's, it's not really better than what you had before. And then you start the, innovation, the, the effect of the intended innovation kicks in and that you have a ramp up. And then you kind of consume all the benefits of the innovation and you, you plateau. And that's an S-curve, you know, exponential curves just go through the roof, S-curve just increase and plateau afterward. And, uh, and typically, the progress in computer hardware is made of thousands of S-curves. And here we have a bit of a, of a paradox, which is from the layman perspective, this is an exponential growth. However, if you happen to be an expert, what you see is all those S-curves individually, and you see them plateauing. So, if you, so experts tend to have some kind of a pessimistic view because what they see is all those curves plateauing ahead. However, what even the experts don't see is the apparition of new S-curves that just surprise everybody, and hence the exponential growth of progress uh, continues. However, computing, if computing hardware is still progressing, um, the rate of progress uh, is, is nowhere near what we had in the 80s or 90s. Um, computing hardware is still progressing. However, um, it is now, the pace is much slower. And uh, it is also quite predictable just because the sort of investment that are required to bring, you know, um, uh, new factories to build the sort of computing hardware are so heavy that, that it is literally uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, of, of investments. Um, and thus, you have a visibility, you know, five to ten years ahead. I mean, this is, obviously, this is not perfect, but that's why uh, progress has slowed down. And, uh, and we have, I would say, a fairly accurate view of what will happen in terms of uh, progress of computing hardware for essentially the next decade. And the lesson from the enterprise software perspective, so if you're looking at those numerical recipes implemented by a piece of, of enterprise software, is that um, you cannot expect, and we'll get back to that later on in this lecture, you cannot passively expect that future hardware will make everything better for you. This is not how it works anymore. Nowadays, hardware is still progressing. However, it takes effort from the software side 
to actually capture this progress, which means that, yes, uh, ulti um, you will be able to do more uh, with uh, the hardware that will exist you know, a decade from now, but if and only if the architecture that has been adopted at the core of your enterprise, your piece of enterprise software, really embrace the underlying computing hardware. Otherwise, you might actually, and that's a trick with the progress of computing hardware nowadays, you might actually do worse than what you're doing today. And we will see it's not as un uh, un a proposition that is as unreasonable as it sounds. This lecture is um, the first of the fourth chapter in this series of supply chain lectures. Um, I have not finished the uh, third chapter that is about uh, supply chain per sine. Actually, in the following, I will probably be alternating between uh, the present chapter that is about where I'm covering the auxiliary sciences of supply chain and uh, the third chapter that is about um, the supply chain per sine. In the very first um, chapter, the prologue, I did present uh, my views on supply chain, both as a field of study and as a practice. Um, and we have seen in this chapter that um, supply chain was essentially a collection of wicked problems by opposition to tame problems. So problems that are plagued by adversarial behavior. It's a competitive game, essentially. And thus, we need to pay a great deal of attention to the methodology because naive direct methodologies um, typically perform very, very poorly in this sort of fields. And that's why the whole second chapter was entirely dedicated to the sort of methodology that we need to study supply chains, but also to establish any kind of, of practice to improve them over time. The third chapter, Supply Chain Personae, was entirely dedicated to the characterization of the supply chain problems themselves. And the motto is essentially fall in love with the problem, not with the solution. And that's exactly what the third chapter is about. It's characterizing all those problems. And the fourth chapter that we're opening today is about the auxiliary sciences of supply chains. So auxiliary sciences are disciplines that support the study of another discipline. And this, there is no judgment value. It's not about that there is uh, disciplines that are superior to other disciplines. Uh, uh, medicine is not superior to biology. It just happened that it's a different focus. However, um, uh, biology is an auxiliary uh, discipline, an auxiliary science for medicine. The perspective of auxiliary sciences is, is well established and it's very it's, it's even prevalent in many, many fields of research. Um, um, probably the two notable ones are medicine, medical sciences, and history. For example, medical sciences, we have, uh, we have auxiliary sciences that are going to be biology, chemistry, physics, sociology, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and um, uh, a practitioner, you know, a physician, uh, um, from the modern perspective, a physician would not be considered as competent if this person would have no knowledge of physics whatsoever. If this person uh, wants to be able to look at an X-ray image, this person needs some basic background in physics to understand what is going on. This is not magic. And so those, um, those complex science, and the same is true for history, where you have, you have like a, a very long series of auxiliary sciences. And when it comes to supply chain, um, my, one of the biggest reproach that I, I could make about um, typical you know, supply chain materials, supply chain courses, um, supply chain books, um, supply chain papers, is that um, they treat the subject um, without ever delving into any of the auxiliary sciences. They, they, they treat supply chain um, as if it was something that was completely isolated, that, that could be where it was a piece of knowledge that was only uh, um, self-standing, if you want. I don't believe that it's true. I believe that modern um, uh, supply chain can only be practiced by really leveraging to the full extent what the auxiliary sciences of supply chains have to offer. And one of them, and that's the one that is of interest today, is computing hardware. Thus, the lecture today is not exactly a supply chain lecture. It is more like uh, um, uh, computing hardware 
with um, supply chain application in mind. However, I believe that it's absolutely fundamental if we want to do uh, um, supply chain the modern way and not you know, uh, the way it was done uh, one century ago. So let's have a look at modern computers. Um, in this lecture, we will uh, review what they can do for supply chain, and in particular, we will review a series of angles that are of specific interest, and in particular, the sort of angles that have uh, typically a massive impact on the performance of enterprise software. So we will review latency, compute, memory, data storage, and bandwidth. That's quite a program. Um, let's get started. The speed of light is about 30 centimeters, 30 centimeters, that's about that, per nanosecond. And it's, it's fairly slow, actually. Um, indeed, if you think in terms of what is, you know, the sort of characteristic distance of interest for a modern CPU that operates at 5 gigahertz, that means, you know, 5 billion operations per second, that, that is what you can find uh, in commerce, you know, for, for modern CPUs. And the round trip distance uh, that, the, that the light can do in 0.2 nanosecond is only three centimeter. That means that you cannot have interaction due to the limitation of speed of light beyond three centimeters. And this is one hard limitation. I mean, it's literally the law of physics and it's very unclear whether we will ever manage to lift this limitation. But latency is, um, is an exceedingly hard constraints. Uh, and and uh, you have to consider that from a supply chain perspective, we have at least two distributions of computing hardware that are involved. When I say distributing, dist uh, distributed computing hardware, I mean, uh, I mean um, computing hardware that involves many devices that cannot occupy the same physical space. Obviously, you, you need to keep them apart just because they, they, have, uh, uh, they have dimensions of their own, if you want. However, we have the first, um, the first uh, element why we need to have distributed computing is just the nature of supply chain that are geographically distributed. Indeed, you know, by, by design, supply chains are spreading across geographies and thus uh, there will be uh, computing hardware that spread over those uh, geographies as well. And as you can see, um, from the speed of light perspective, even if you have devices that are only like three meters apart, it's already very slow because we are talking of 100 clock cycle, you know, to do the round trip. It is three meters is already quite, quite a distance from the perspective of the speed of light and obviously the clock rate of modern CPUs. And then we also have another type of distribution, which is uh, the horizontal scaling. Um, the modern way of having more processing power at our disposal is not to have like a, a, a computing device that is 10 times more powerful or a million times more powerful, that, that is not the way it is actually engineered. If you want more uh, processing resources, what you need is extra computing device, um, uh, devices. So you need more processors, you need more memory chips, you need more hard drives. You know, it's, it's by piling up the hardware that you can have more uh, computational resources at your disposal. However, all those devices take space and thus you end up distributing your computing hardware just because you can't centralize into you know, a, 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 a centimeter wide uh, um, computer. By the way, when it comes to uh, latencies, um, when we look at the sort of latencies that we have on the professional internet, and when I say professional internet, I mean the sort of, of latencies that you can get in a data center, not the sort of latencies that you can get over your crappy Wi-Fi at home. Um, uh, um, when we look at the sort of professional latencies that we can have, we are already at present day within 30% of the speed of light. So if we are looking at the sort of latencies that we can have between a data center near Paris, France, and uh, New York, United States, the latency that we will get between those two data centers is only within 30% of the speed of light, which is an incredible achievement for mankind. It means that literally uh, information is flowing across the internet at the speed of light. 
yes, there is still a bit of room for improvement, but we see we are already within 30% of the hard limit imposed by physics. This is already very, very, very good. And, and by the way, as a result, there are even companies now who want to lay um, cable um, through the Arctic seafloor, um, basically to connect London to Tokyo, uh, so with a cable that would go under the North Pole, just to shave a few milliseconds of latencies for financial transactions. So it's um, fundamentally, la latencies um, and the speed of light is a very real concern, and the internet that we have is essentially already as good as it will ever be, unless some people do faster than light breakthrough or something. But that would require a whole new kind of physics, and we have nothing like that looming ahead for the next decade. Maybe, but I, I would not count on it, at least not for the next decade. And it turned out that due to the fact that latency is a super hard problem, uh, it, it, the implication for enterprise software is that RAN trips are deadly. When you need to have RAN trips in terms of flow of information, and typically those RAN trips are internal within your systems. And the performance of your system, of your you know, piece of enterprise software, will be um, largely be dependent on the number of RAN trips that you will have uh, that you will have in between the various subsystems that exist within your uh, enterprise software. And those, those number of run trips will characterize, you know, sort of, of incompressible, incompressible latency that you suffer. And that's, um, and uh, minimizing run trips and improving latencies is for most pieces of enterprise software, and that's, that very much include um, the enterprise software dedicated to um, the predictive optimization of supply chains, um, the, the number one problem is to uh, mitigate those, those latencies, to cope with them so that, and improving the latency is very frequently um, uh, uh, equates uh, delivering a, a better performance, actually. An interesting trick, I'm not saying that it's not really something that everybody in this audience will actually deploy in production for um, uh, next year, but um, is the following. One of the major complication introduced by uh, latency is that time itself where uh, it becomes something extremely el uh, elusive and fuzzy when you're entering the realm of uh, nanoseconds calculation. I mean, you, you're kind of used in your day-to-day -day perception to fairly accurate clocks. However, when you enter the realm, uh, the realm of distributed computings, uh, of distributed computing, um, accurate clocks kind of disappear. Uh, and it, uh, they are certainly nowhere as precise as nanosecond precise. And thus, it introduced tons of complication. And um, within a piece of distributed enterprise software, um, there are numerous run trips that are only needed to, um, to synchronize the various piece of, of the system. And you need, for example, due to the fact that you, you don't have an accurate clock, it doesn't you know, exist uh, across the board, what you end up with is um, alternatives that are algorithmic alternatives such as um, or called um, vector, vector clocks or multi-part timestamps, if you want, which are data structures that reflect a partial ordering of the various clocks that you have in your systems, and they require extra round trips in your system. And that's obviously, those extra round trips are going to hurt your performance, and uh, a very clever uh, uh, design that was adopted more than a decade ago by, by Google was actually to use um, uh, cheap scale atomic clock. So just to give you an order of magnitude, the sort of quartz-based clock that you have in your, in your watch, electronic watches or computers, they tend to drift about half a second a day. That's their typical resolution. However, if we go for um, the sort of cheap scale uh, atomic clocks that were available fi um, uh, 15 years ago, the resolution was already about 0 0.1 millisecond per day. So that th those, the, the resolution of those atomic clocks is like 5,000 times better. And NIST demonstrated, I don't know if it's commercialized uh, at present day, but they, they, they demonstrated um, two years ago uh, a, new, uh, uh, a new setup of, uh, of cheap scale atomic clock that, had, uh, even, uh, that was 1,000 times more precise, so it was 0.1 uh, microseconds in terms of daily drift. And it turned out that um, Google, to design Google Spanner, which is uh, a distributed, a globally distributed um, SQL database, if you want, used uh, internally uh, atomic clocks 
to synchronize their various parts and thus save round trips. And that is literally one of the key of the performance that they can get at the global scale. And that's a way to cheat latency through very, very precise time measurement. I suspect that if we look a decade ahead, uh, Google will not be the last company to use this sort of very clever tricks. And they are cheap, by the way. They are just something like $1,500 you know, uh, a piece to have um, this uh, cheap scale atomic clock. Now, let's have a look at, uh, at compute. So it's literally about doing computations with, uh, with, uh, with a computer. The clock speed is, uh, was the magical ingredient of the improvement during the 80s and the 90s. And indeed, um, if you could, across the board, double the clock speed of your computer, you would effectively double the performance of your computer. And you would double the performance no matter which kind of software is involved. So that's, that's the magic when you can increase the clock speed across the board for all components. Um, the, the, any software, enterprise software, machine learning software, scientific software, games, whatever, all the software are linearly you know, uh, faster according to the clock speed. So it is extremely interesting to increase the clock speed. And the clock speed is still improving, although the improvement has really flattened. Um, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, um, the clock speed was about um, 2 gigahertz. And nowadays, uh, about two decades later, it is 5 gigahertz. And the curve has really flattened over time. So, so yes, clock speed is still improving, but very slowly. And the, the key reason for that is um, what is known as the power wall, the power wall. Um, the problem is that when you increase the clock speed on, on a chip, if you add 30%, you tend to uh, roughly double the amount of, uh, of energy consumption, you tend to double the energy consumption, and then you have to dissipate this energy. And the problem is the thermal dissipation. So, because if you can't dissipate the energy, what happens is that uh, um, your device is building up heat to the point where um, the device is so hot that it actually de damages the, de the, the device itself. And thus, nowadays, uh, processors are actually, uh, the, the whole industry, the whole semiconductor industry moved from having more operations per second, that was really the dominant paradigm in the 90s, you know, you wanted uh, in a given second to have more operations, from having more operations per second to more operations per watt. That's, uh, that is the key metric of interest. And here you see that this rule of plus 30% plus double the energy con uh, consumption, um, it is a double-edged sword because you can reverse this rule. That means that if you are okay to give up um, a quarter of your processing power, you know, per unit of time on, on, on the CPU, you can actually divide the power consumption by two. This is very, very interesting, especially, let's say, for smartphones, where you really want to save uh, energy. But it is also of interest from a cloud computing perspective because uh, one of the key driver of cloud computing costs for companies who operate uh, cloud computing platforms is the, uh, is the cost of energy itself. So what you see is that now if you want to have very uh, cost effective cloud computing uh, processing power, it's not going to be super, super fast uh, CPUs. On the contrary, it's going to be CPUs that are underclocked. They can be you know, as slow as uh, one gigahertz uh, because they, uh, they give you much more bangs, which are floating points operation per second, or just operations per second, for your bucks, which are the watts that you inject the energy into the system. And also, um, the, the, power, uh, the, the, the power wall is such a problem that nowadays, you know, modern uh, architecture are, are using all sorts of clever tricks to mitigate that. For example, modern CPUs, they can really regulate their clock speed. They can temporarily, for a second or so, boost the clock speed, and so they, they, they will gradually you know, overheat the processor, and then they will, um, they will go 
uh, they will reduce their clock speed to dissipate the heat. They, they, they can really adjust their clock speed. And they are also leveraging uh, what is called dark silicon. The idea is that if the CPU is able to alternate the areas on the chip that are hot, um, it is easier to dissipate the energy as opposed to have always the same area that, clocks, that clock cycle after clock cycle is always active. And that's also a very key ingredient of modern design. From an enterprise software perspective, it means that what you really want to be able is to do scale out. You want to be able to do more with many times more CPUs, but individually, those processors are going to be weaker than the previous one that you had. You see, this is not about getting better processors in the sense that everything is better across the board. It's about having processors that gives you more operations per watt, uh, and this trend will continue. So maybe, maybe we will probably see some, um, I'm relatively optimistic, you know, some, some uh, marginal ongoing in terms of clock rate. You know, maybe a decade from now, we will uh, reach with difficulty seven, maybe eight gigahertz, but I'm not even sure, sure that we get there. And when I look at the sort of clock speed that I get uh, in 2021 in most cloud uh, computing providers, it's more, uh, it's, it's more aligned with typically two gigahertz. So we are back to the clock speed that we had 20 years ago in the major cloud, and that is the most cost-effective solution. Now, reaching the present CPU performance required a whole series of key innovation, and I'm going to present uh, a, a few of them, um, especially the one that have the most impact on the design of the enterprise software. Um, uh, so this, on, this, on this screen, what you're seeing is the instruction flow of a sequential processor. As, as processors were made essentially uh, up to the early 80s. And what you can see is that you have a series of, uh, of instructions that execute, you know, um, going from the top of the graph to the bottom, so that gives you the time. And um, those, um, every instruction goes through a series of stages. Um, there are here on this schema, there are four stages that are being represented. Fetch, decode, execute, write back. And, and typically, when the CPU wants to do computation, it has to go through one instruction at a time. And every instruction, you have to go through one stage at a time. Um, during uh, fetch, you're going to fetch the instruction register, grab the next in, uh, instruction, increment the instruction counter, and prepare uh, the CPU. During the decode, you're typically going to decode the instruction and typically produce or emit the internal microcode. Uh, which is what the CPU is really executing internally. Um, then you have the execution, which is literally grab uh, the relevant inputs from the registers, do the actual calculation. And by the way, a CPU is uh, the sort of, um, of, of instruction that you have in the CPU is do an addition, do a multiplication, do a division, you know, just a very, very basic uh, operations uh, that you have. And, and uh, they are very simple building blocks. And then write back, which is just get the result of, uh, uh, that you've just computed and put it somewhere in one of the register. And thus you iterate. And what you can see in this sequential processor is that uh, every single stage requires one clock cycle. So um, in order to complete one instruction on this, uh, uh, on this, uh, on this graph, the, this processor needs actually four clock cycles. So it, it takes four clock cycles to execute one instruction. And as we have seen, it is very, very difficult to increase um, the frequency of the clock cycles themselves because we have tons of complications. Thus, the key trick that has been in place since the early 80s and onward is known as pipelining. And pipelining uh, can enormously speed up the calculation of your processor. And the idea is, um, due to the fact that every single instruction goes through a series of stages, we are going to overlap the stages. And thus, the CPU itself is going to have a, a whole pipeline of instruction. And here on the schema, you can see uh, a CPU that has essentially a, a, a pipeline of depth four, where there is always, at any point of time, four instructions that are being executed concurrently, except they are not in the same stage. 
There is one instruction that is in the stage fetch, one instruction in the stage decode, one in execute, and one in writeback. And with this simple trick, where we have, um, we have uh, and this schema represents a pipeline processor, we have multiplied um, the, um, the effective performance of the processor by four, by just pipelining um, the, uh, the operations, and all modern CPUs are doing pipelining. And the next stage of this improvement is called super pipelining, because indeed, modern CPUs go way beyond simple pipelining as I, did, uh, as I did present. In reality, the number of stages involved in a real modern CPU is more like 30 stages. And thus you have 30 instruction. Here I'm, I'm just representing on, on the graph, you can see uh, a, a CPU where I just put 12 stage. Uh, you know, it's a uh, fetch would be three, st three, three stages, uh, decode three stages, execute three stages, and write back three stages. But the reality, if we are to look at a, a real modern processor, it would be more like 30 stages. Obviously it's inconvenient to represent. Uh, so uh, what happens is that suddenly we have a much deeper pipeline and we have 12 uh, operations that are executing concurrently. And that's very good because then we are gaining, you know, in terms of performance, we are gaining a factor 12, still having the exact same clock cycle. However, we have a new problem. The new problem is that now the next instruction starts before the previous one is finished. You see, in the here, uh, the, blue, the blue cell was always after the end of the previous blue cell. Here, this is, not, this is not the case. You have an overlap, which means that if you have operations that are dependent, you have a problem because uh, by the time you want to start the next instruction, the calculation of the inputs for this instruction are not uh, ready yet. They are not available yet. And thus, you have to wait. Uh, and we don't want to wait, we want to uh, utilize uh, the entire pipeline that is at our, our disposal to maximize, you know, sort of processing power that we will get from this super pipeline processor. Thus, what, what uh, modern CPUs are doing is that they are going to fetch not one instruction at a time, but something like 500 instructions at a time. And they are going to look really far ahead in the, uh, in the list of uh, upcoming instruction, and they are going to rearrange the instructions to kind of mitigate all the dependencies so that they will interleave the execution flows um, in order to be able to leverage the full depth of the pipeline. However, there are plenty of things that complicate uh, this operation, and most notably, um, the branches. So the branches, a branch is just a condition. For, for those of you who are programming, it's literally what, what happens when you write an if. You know, you have a condition with a Boolean, the, con the result of the condition can be true or false, and depending on um, the result, your program will execute a, a piece of logic or another piece of logic. And obviously, that complicates uh, the sort of dependency because if, in order to really look far ahead, the CPU has to guess the direction the br upcoming branches are going to go. And that's what CPUs are doing nowadays. They do what is called branch prediction. Um, they are very simple heuristics, um, and they are very, very good at it in terms of forecasting accuracy. Uh, modern CPUs can forecast direction of branches with um, over 99% accuracy, which is, by the way, a lot better than what most of us can do in uh, a real supply chain context. But as far as uh, branch prediction is concerned, 99% uh, accuracy is not even, uh, even state-of-the-art anymore. I don't exactly know where they stand, but it's, it's, it's staggeringly high. And this precision is needed to leverage super deep pipelines, by the way. And just to give you an idea on the sort of heuristics that are used to do those, uh, those predictions, uh, a very simple heuristic is simply to say the branch will go the same, w the same direction it went last time. Just this simple heuristic gives you something like 90% accuracy, which is quite good. If you, say, if you add a twist to this heuristic, which is um, the branch will go the same direction than last time, but you need to consider the origin. So th it's the same branch w coming from the same origin. Then uh, you will get something like a 95% accuracy. And modern CPUs are actually d using fairly complex perceptron um, which is a machine learning technique uh, 
to predict um, the, the direction of the branches. Now, um, under the right condition, so you, you, you can predict uh, fairly accurately the branch, and thus you can leverage a full pipeline and get the most of um, the modern processor. However, it means that from a software engineering perspective, you need to play nice with your processor. You need to play, especially, you need to play nice with uh, branch prediction. Because if, if you don't play nice, it means that the branch predictor is going to get it wrong. And when that happens, um, when so the, the CPU, you know, predict the direction of the branch, organize the pipeline, and start doing the calculation ahead of time, either when the branch is actually encountered and that the calculation is effectively done, the CPU will realize that the branch prediction is wrong. So uh, uh, an incorrect branch prediction do not result in an incorrect result. It results in a loss of performance, actually. Uh, what happens is that the CPU is going to realize very, very late in the pipeline that uh, a branch was mispredicted, and thus the CPU will have no alternative but to essentially flush the entire pipeline or, or a fair portion of the pipeline, wait until uh, other calculations are made, and then restart uh, the calculation. And the performance hit can be very significant. You can very easily lose one order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude sometimes. Um, due to uh, hardware that, uh, so, sorry, enterprise software logic that do not play well with regard to the branch prediction logic of your CPU. Now, you can also, there, are other, there is another very notable uh, trick beyond pipelining, and this is the super scalar instruction. So remember, I said that CPUs typically um, process um, essentially. Um, w w scalars, one scala a, a, a pair of scalars at a time. So that would be, for example, two numbers, f um, maybe you know, um, 32 bits, floating point precision numbers. Um, it can be uh, two numbers at a time, and you just add them or multiply them or, div or divide one by the other, etc. So they do scalar operation, essentially, you know, one number at a time. However. Um, modern CPUs uh, for the last decade have pretty much all featured superscalar instruction. And superscalar instruction uh, can actually grab a, a vector, several vectors of numbers, and do uh, uh, vector operation on the directly, which means that um, a CPU can take a vector of, let's say, eight floating point numbers and then a second vector of eight floating point numbers and do the addition and you get a vector of floating uh, uh, that represents the results of this addition and all of that is done in one cycle. So that's, that's um, um, for example, there are specialized instruction set, AVX2 essentially let you um, do operation considering 32 bits of precision uh, by a pack of eight numbers, AVX3 lets you do that with packs of 16 numbers. So the, the speed up, if you have, if you're capable of leveraging those um, those those instruction, it it means that you can literally gain um, an order of magnitude in terms of processing speed, because one instruction, one clock cycle, does a lot more calculation than it does if you have processing numbers one by one. This process is known as SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. And um, it is very, very powerful. It is driving actually the bulk of the progress over the last decade uh, in terms of processing power. And, um, and modern processors are increasingly you know, vector-based, um, super scalar. However, from, a, um, um, from, a super, from an enterprise software perspective, it is relatively tricky. I said, you know, with pipelining, that your software had to play nice, and maybe your software is playing nice with the branch prediction accidentally. However, when it comes to superscalar instruction, there is nothing accidental. Your software really need to do some stuff explicitly, I mean, most of the time, to leverage this extra processing power. You don't get it for free. You need to really embrace this vision, and um, uh, you need typically to organize the, the, the data itself so that um, you have data parallelism, um, so that the data itself is, is organized in a way that is suitable for those SIMD instructions. It's not rocket science, but it doesn't happen accidentally, and that's really, that gives you, you really uh, a massive boost in terms of 
processing power. Now, we are looking at um, the instruction flow that is one instruction per core. However, modern CPUs uh, can have many cores. One core, one CPU core can give you uh, uh, a distinct flow of instruction. And what happens is that with very, very modern CPUs uh, that have many, many cores, um, uh, typically very modern present day CPUs can go up to 64 cores, so 64 independent concurrent flow of, uh, of execution, um, you can pretty much reach about one teraflop. That's the sort of uh, upper hand uh, processing throughput that you can get from a, a very modern processor. However, if you want to go beyond that, you can look at, uh, at GPUs, graphical processing units. So despite, you know, you, you might think that, oh, or in other words, you know, graphic cards. Um, the term graphic cards is kind of deceptive, so that's why people tend to call it um, GPUs nowadays, because actually, uh, from an enterprise perspective, you can do things with those, um, uh, with those devices that have nothing to do with graphics. Essentially, uh, um, a graphic card like the one that is uh, on, on the screen from NVIDIA is a, a, a super scalar processor. It's instead of having up to 64 cores, like you know, high-end CPUs of present day, um, graphic cards can have uh, more than 10,000 cores. It's, 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 uh, obviously, those cores are much simpler. They are not as powerful as um, regular CPU cores. Um, they are not as fast as regular CPU cores. However, you have many times more of those cores. And thus, if you, and, and they, they literally bring this padding of SIMD, you know, single instruction multiple data, really on steroid, where you can crunch not only a pack of eight or 16 numbers at a time, but literally thousands of numbers at a time to do those vector instruction. So um, with, uh, with graphic card, you can um, you know, go into the range of 30 plus teraflops on just one device. And that's, that's absolutely enormous. So you see, um, the, the, best, the best CPUs of the market will maybe give you um, one teraflop, um, the best graphic cards of the market are going to give you 30 plus teraflops. That's, again, that's more than an order of magnitude of difference. This is very, very significant. And if, um, if you go even beyond that, if you go for, um, for specialized type of calculations, such, uh, um, such as, for example, linear algebra, and by the way, things like um, uh, machine learning theories like deep learning are essentially uh, um, um, matrix involved linear algebra all over the place, and it's you can have processors like TPUs, tensor processing unit. Um, Google decided to name them tensor because it was, you know, uh, reminiscent of TensorFlow. But the reality is that those tensor processing unit would be better named matrix multiplication processing unit. And the interesting thing with the matrix multiplication is that not only there are tons of data parallelism involved, but there is also uh, enormous amount of repetition involved in term because the, the operations are highly, highly repetitive. And by organizing a TPU as a, a systolic array, you, uh, which is basically a, a two-dimensional grid uh, uh, with, with computational units uh, on, on, on the grid, you can reach, um, uh, you can bridge, you know, the petaflop barrier, uh, so 1,000 plus teraflops on just a single device. Um, although uh, there is a caveat, is that uh, Google is doing it with um, 16 bits, you know, BFLOT16, which are mean, which are floating points numbers, but with only 16 bits of precision instead of the usual 32. However, 16 bits of precision from a supply chain perspective is not bad. It means that you have something like 0.1% of accuracy in your operations. And uh, for many, you know, machine learning or statistical operation, 0.1% uh, of accuracy is actually uh, quite fine if you, if you do it right and if you make sure that you don't accumulate bias. And thus, uh, what we see is that um, the path of progress in terms of computing hardware, um, when we look at just compute, has been to go for um, devices that are uh, more specialized and more specialized, 
and more rigid, but, but thanks to the specialization, you can have enormous gains in terms of processing power. So if you go from a, a, a super scalar instruction, you gain uh, an order of magnitude. If you go for graphic cards, you gain one or two order of magnitudes. And if you go for uh, pure linear algebra, you gain uh, um, essentially uh, two orders of magnitude. And that's, that's uh, very, very significant. And from, um, um, and by the way, all of those um, uh, design, hardware designs, are two-dimensional. Um, uh, modern chips, uh, modern, modern uh, you know, uh, processing structures, they are very, very flat. Um, uh, a modern CPU uh, does not involve more than typically something like 20 layers. And, and since that layers are only you know, a few microns thick, it means that essentially CPUs uh, or, 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 or GPUs or, um, or TPUs are extremely flat structure. And you might think, oh, what about the third dimension? Well, it, it turned out that due to the, the, the power wall, which is the, all the problems that we have to dissipate the energy, we can't really go to, into the third dimension because then if we do that, we don't know how to evacuate all the energy that is, uh, that is poured into the device. So uh, what we can predict for the next decade is that those devices will remain essentially uh, uh, two-dimensional. From the software, uh, uh, um, from the enterprise software perspective, it means that uh, the biggest lesson is that you need to engineer data parallelism right at the core of your software. If you don't do that, then you will not be able to capture the, all the progress that are happening as far uh, the processing, the raw compute power is concerned. However, it cannot be an afterthought. It's literally um, it, it has to happen at the very core of the architecture, at the very level at which you organize all the data that has to be processed in your systems. If you don't do that, well, um, you're stuck. You will be stuck with essentially the sort of processors we had two decades ago. Now, memory. In the early 80s, memory was as fast as processors. And that means that essentially one clock cycle was one clock cycle for the memory and one clock cycle for the CPU. However, this is not the case anymore. Over time, since the 80s, um, the ratio between the speed of memory, the sort of latencies that you have to access the memory, and the latencies that you have to access data that already sit in the registers of the processor has only been increasing. Uh, we started at pretty much, you know, ratio of one, and we have now a ratio that is typically greater than a thousand. That uh, this problem is known as the memory wall, and this problem has only been increasing over the last four decades. It is still increasing nowadays, although very slowly, just because, well, the the, 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 the clock speed of processors itself is increasing very, very slowly. So that it's, 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 uh, it's just the fact that due to the fact that processors are not proce progressing, uh, almost not progressing anymore in terms of clock speed, that this problem of memory war is not uh, increasing any further. However, the place that we are left at at the moment is incredibly imbalanced, where accessing the, the memory is um, essentially three orders of magnitude slower than accessing data that sits already conveniently inside the processor. And this perspective completely defeats um, all the classic algorithmics, uh, all the classic algorithms as they are taught, as they are still taught nowadays in most universities. Um, the classic algorithmic viewpoint assume that you, have, that you can have a uniform time to access the memory, so accessing any bit of memory um, takes the same amount of time, but in modern systems, this is absolutely not uh, the case. Um, the, the time it takes to access a certain, uh, a certain portion of, of, of memory very much depends on where is the actual data physically within your computer system. And from an enterprise software perspective, where it turned out that unfortunately, most of um, the software design that, get, that got established during the, during the 80s and 90s um, ignored the problem altogether because this problem was very uh, minor during the first decade. It only really inflated over the last two decades. But as a result, uh, most of um, the patterns that you would see in, in, in present-day uh, uh, pieces of enterprise software uh, 
completely antagonize um, uh, this design because the design pretty much assumed that you have uniform, uh, that you have uh, a, a constant time access for all, uh, for, um, uh, for all the memory. And by the way, if you start thinking about uh, processing, I would say, uh, programming languages, let's say, for example, Python, um, that was invented uh, in uh, that, that was released the first version in 1989 or, or Java in 1995 um, that that are featuring, for example, object-oriented programming. It it goes very much against what uh, the way memory works in uh, in modern computers. Indeed, whenever you have objects, and it's even worse if you have, like in Python, you have late bindings uh, because it means that. To do anything, you will have to follow pointers and do random jumps into the memory. And if one of those jumps happen to be unlucky, because it's a portion that does not happen to be already sitting in the processor, it can be a thousand times slower. And that's, that's a very, very big problem. Uh, to, to, to better grasp the extent of the memory wall, it's, uh, uh, it's interesting to look at the typical latencies that you have in a modern computer. So if we look at the sort of latencies, and on this schema, you have the latency at 0 0.3 uh, nanosecond that start, which is you know, a 3 gigahertz processor. And um, you will go down to something that is up to 10 milliseconds uh, if you want to access a rotation disk. And again, orders of magnitude are deceptive. So that's why it's very interesting to rescale those latencies and to say, what if uh, a processor was operating at one clock cycle per second? So the, the latency, the typical latency of the CPU was one second. Let's rescale, in human terms, the sort of latencies that we have. Here, and that's the scale, that's the scale latencies that you can see on the graph. And here we see that um, that would mean that we have a processor that can do one operation per second. However, if we want to access data that is on disk, it can take, you know, first, if we want to access data that is in memory, it can take up to six minutes. So you see that accessing the memory, you, you can, you know, do one operation per second, but if you want to access something that is in the memory, uh, you have to wait six minutes. And if you want to access something that is on disk, whoo, that can take, you know, a month up to a whole year. This is incredibly long. And that's what those orders of magnitude of performance that I was mentioning at the very beginning of this lecture are about. It's uh, when, you, when you're playing with 15 orders of magnitude, uh, it is very deceptive. You don't necessarily realize that um, the sort of massive performance hit that you can have um, where literally you can end up having to wait the human equivalent of month if, you, if you're not putting the information in the right place. This is absolutely gigantic. By the way, um, uh, enterprise software are not the only sort of software engineers that are struggling with all this evolution of the modern computing hardware. If we look, for example, even uh, at the sort of latencies that we get with super fast SSD cards as the one provided by uh, in Intel with the Optane series, um, you can see, and that's, um, that's essentially the graph that you have uh, on the left of the screen, is uh, that half of the latency that you will get to access the memory on this device is actually caused by overhead of the kernel itself. In this case, it is uh, the Linux kernel. So it's the operating system itself that generates half of the latency. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that even the people who are engineering Linux have uh, some further work to do to basically catch up with modern, the modern hardware. But nonetheless, so it just means that it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge for everybody. However, it really hurts uh, enterprise software, especially in when we are thinking about supply chain optimization, just due to the fact that we have tons of data to process. So it's already quite a complex undertaking uh, from the start. So that's why it's, it's really a challenge. From the enterprise software perspective, um, it means that you really need to embrace a design that play really, really nice with a cache because the cache is like local copies that can be made you know, closer to uh, the CPU um, that are faster to access. And the way it works is that when you access a, a byte in your main memory, you can't access just one byte in modern software. When you want to access even one byte in your RAM, 
uh, what, what happens is that um, uh, the hardware will actually copy four kilobytes. Uh, and, and not four kilobytes at random. They are going to take essentially the whole, uh, the, the whole page uh, that is uh, four, four kilobytes large. And um, the underlying assumption is that when you start to read a byte, the next byte that you're going to request is going to be the one that follow. And that's, that's a sort of locality principle, which means that if you play by the rule and you really enforce access that preserve the locality, um, then you can essentially have a memory that appears to be working almost as fast as, uh, as, uh, as your processor. However, that really requires, um, uh, I would say, alignment between the, the memory accesses and the locality of the data. And, and in particular, there are plenty of languages, um, um, let's say, for example, Python, uh, that do not deliver this sort of things uh, natively. Or quite on the contrary, they are really a massive challenge to bring any degree of locality, and that's, that's an immense struggle and an uphill battle where essentially you have a programming language that, is, that has uh, been designed around, um, uh, around, I would say, patterns that completely antagonize the sort of hardware that is at our disposal. And that's not going to change you know, in, in the decade that is, uh, that is coming. It's, uh, this problem is only going to get worse. Thus, um, from an enterprise software pa uh, perspective, essentially you want to enforce locality of the data, but also minification. If you can make your data, your big data, small data, it will be faster. That's something that is kind of, uh, that is not very intuitive, but if you can shrink the size of the data, typically by, by uh, eliminating some redundancy, this sort of things, um, you can make your program faster because you will be much more, you will be much nicer with the cache, you will fit more relevant data in the lower cache that have much uh, lower latencies as shown on this display. Finally, let's, let's discuss specifically the case of DRAM. DRAM is literally the physical component that uh, build up the RAM that you have in, um, uh, that you use for your desktop workstation you know, or your uh, server in the cloud. DRAM is, a, is, a, is literally what people call also the main memory. The main memory is, is built from DRAM chips. Now, what we can see is that DRAM over the last decade uh, ha in terms of pricing has barely decreased. We went from uh, Five, uh, $5 per gigabyte to $3 per gigabyte, you know, a decade later. So the price of RAM is still decreasing, although it's not decreasing uh, very fast. It's actually, uh, it's, it, it has been very much stagnating over uh, the next couple of years. And, um, and due to the fact that building, there is only like three major players in this market that, that even have, you know, the capacity to manufacture DRAM at scale. Um, there is very little you know, hope that um, there will be anything unexpected in this market for the decade to come. But that's not even the worst of the problem. There is also the, the, the power consumption per gigabyte. And if you look at the sort of power consumption, um, it turns out that uh, modern day RAM is consuming a little bit more uh, power per gigabyte than it used to one decade ago. And the reason is essentially that the RAM that we have present there is faster. And that's the same thing, you know, the same rule of, of, of the power wall. If you increase the clock frequency, you uh, increase uh, very significantly uh, the power consumption. And thus, uh, the, what we have, uh, and by the way, RAM consumes quite a lot of, of, of power because RA DRAM is fundamentally an active component. You need to refresh the RAM all the time because there is electric leakage. So um, if, you, if you power off your RAM, you, you lose all your data. You need to essentially re refresh uh, the cells all the time. And thus, um, what is the conclusion? Well, the conclusion for enterprise software is that essentially DRAM is the one component that is not progressing anymore. Um, there are tons of things that are still progressing very rapidly, uh, l like, like processing power. However, this is not the case for DRAM. It, it's, it's very much stagnating. And if we factor in uh, the power cost, the power consumption, which also amounts for a fair portion of the cloud computing cost, um, RAM is, is barely making any progress. And thus, if you adopt a design that over emphasizes 
uh, the main memory. And that's typically what you will get whenever you have a vendor that says, oh, we have an in-memory design for a software. Remember these keywords. Whenever you hear a vendor that tells you they have an in-memory design, what the vendor is telling you, and this is not a very compelling proposition, what they are telling you is that their design is entirely uh, relies entirely on the future evolution of DRAM where we already know that the costs are not going to decrease. So if we take into account the fact that 10 years from now, your supply chain will probably have at something like 10 times more data to process just because you know, companies are getting better and better at just collecting more data um, inside their supply chains, but also you know, outside their supply chain more to be more collaborative, to collect more data from their clients and collect more of their data from their suppliers. So it is not unreasonable to expect that a decade from now, um, any large company you know, operating a large supply chain will be collecting 10 times more data than, than you have. However, um, <laughs> the, the price per gigabyte of the RAM will still be the same. So if you do the math, you might end up with, uh, with cloud computing cost or IT cost if it's internalized that are essentially something that is almost an order of magnitude more expensive just to do pretty much the same thing just because you have to cope with an ever-growing mass of data that, that do not fit, uh, that don't easily fit in memory. So that's the, the key insight is that you really want to avoid all sorts of in-memory design. Those designs are very, very dated and, uh, and um, we will see um, in what just follows uh, what sort of alternative do we have. Now, let's have a look at, uh, uh, at um, data storage, which is about uh, persistent data storage. Stuff, if you, if you cut the power, you still preserve the data. Essentially, you have two class of very widespread uh, data storage. The first one are um, hard uh, disk drive or rotation disk. The second one, is, it's called HDD in short. The second one is solid state disk, SDD in short. And um, the interesting thing is that the latency on the rotation disk is terrible. And when you look at this picture, you can easily understand why. Those disks, I mean, they literally they rotate. And when you want to access any point, random point of data on the disk, well, on average, you need, because the data is randomly distributed on the disk, you need to wait for half a rotation of the disk. And if you consider that the very top and disks are rotating about 10,000 rotations per minute, it means that uh, you have a built-in three millisecond latency that cannot be compressed. It's literally the time it takes for the disk to rotate and, uh, and, and to be able to read uh, the, the, the precise point of interest on the disk. It's mechanical. It will not improve any further. Also, um, so those disks are, are terrible in terms of latencies, but they also have another problem, which is um, they consume uh, power all the time because uh, the, the bulk of the power, um, as a rule of thumb, uh, an HDD and an SSD, those two devices, they consume about three watts per hour. Um, they tend, you know, per, per, per device. That's typically, you know, the ballpark uh, status quo at, at, uh, at present day. And um, however, when uh, the hard drive is running, even if you're not actively reading anything from the hard drive, you will be consuming three watts. Um, just because you need to keep the disk spinning, just reaching you know, this uh, 10,000 rotations a minute speed take a lot of time, so you need to keep the disk spinning all the time, even if you're using the disk very infrequently. Um, however, when it comes to solid state drive, um, it, they consume three watts when you access the data, but when you don't access the data, they almost don't consume any. I mean, they, are, they have a resi residual power consumption, but it's, it's exceedingly small. It's, it's just like in the order of the milliwatts. So it's, it's, it's very, very small, which is very interesting between that you can have tons of SSDs. Uh, if you're not using that, you don't pay for the, process, for, uh, for the power that they consume. And now, the interesting thing is that the entire industry has been, over the last decade, gradually transitioning from HDD to SSD. And, um, and in order to understand that, we can look at, um, at, those, uh, at this curve. What we see is that, um, essentially, the price per gigabyte of, bo of, uh, of HDD has been going down over the last couple of years. However, the price is now kind of plateauing. The data is a 
tiny bit odd, a uh, uh, tiny bit old, but it didn't vary that much over the last couple of years, the last few years. And what we see is um, during the last 10 years, we see that you know um, uh, a decade ago, uh, per gigabytes, uh, SSDs at the time were extremely expensive, you know, $2,400 dollars per gigabyte one decade ago while um, uh, per terabyte sorry while the hard drive were on, were um, sixty dollars however at present day the price uh, of hard drive has been divided by three essentially at twenty dollars however um, the price of, uh, of of SSDs has been divided by more than 25 and uh, and the trend of uh, of of, uh, of decrease of um, of price of the SSDs is not stopping. So SSDs are right now and probably for the decade to come the component that is progressing the most, and that's very very interesting. Uh, by the way, I told you that um, the design of modern compute devices, uh, CPU, GPU, TPU, uh, were essentially two dimensional with at most 20 layers or so. Uh, however, um, when it comes to SSD, SSDs, um, the, the, the design is increasingly three-dimensional. We have now, um, um, I, I believe that the, the most recent SSDs, they have something like 176 layers. So we are reaching, you know, in terms of orders, uh, 200 layers. And uh, however, due to the fact that those layers are incredibly thin, you know, microns, um, it is not unreasonable to expect that in the future we have uh, devices that have thousands of layers and thus that have thousand times more, uh, potentially, you know, uh, orders of magnitude more storage capabilities. And obviously the trick will be you won't be able to access to all this data all the time. Again, this is dark silicon for you. Uh, you, you need to dissipate power. However, um, it turned out that if you're playing nice, there a lot of data is accessed very, very infrequently. Thus, um, memory, that's, um, by the way, um, there are plenty of things that are where I'm, I'm barely scratching the surface. Um, um, SSDs involved have a very, very specific hardware design that comes with tons of quirks, such as the fact that you can only turn bits uh, uh, on but not off. Essentially, imagine you have, you have initially you have all zeros. You can turn a zero into a one. However, you can't turn this one into a zero locally. So you you if you want to do to do that, you have to reset the whole uh, block that can be as large as eight megabytes. Which means that when you're writing, you can turn bit to, from zero to one, but from not one to zero. And in order to, to turn bits from one to zero, you need to flush the entire blocks and rewrite it, which leads to all sorts of problems known as write amplifications. And again, um, it turned out that during the last decades, uh, SSD drives have internally uh, a layer called the flash translation layers that can mitigate for you all those problems. Uh, and this fla those flash translation layers are getting better and better over time. Um, however, there is like large opportunities to improve further. And um, in terms of enterprise software, it means that you really want to optimize your design to really make the most of SSDs. SSDs are already you know, a much better deal uh, than DRAM when it comes to you know, storing memory, storing data. And if you play it uh, smartly, you can expect um, you know, one decade from now, orders of magnitude of gain that will be earned through the progress of the hardware industry, which is not the case as far as DRAM is concerned. And finally, bandwidth. So bandwidth just uh, is probably the most solved problem uh, in terms of technology. Um, however, even if, if bandwidth can be achieved, you know, we, we can achieve um, the sort of bandwidth that are absolutely insane uh, uh, at, uh, at present date. Um, Commercially, um, the telecom industry is, 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 is very complex and, uh, and there are tons of problems so that end consumers don't necessarily see all the benefits of, um, of the progress that has been made in terms of uh, optical communications. However, in terms of optical communication with uh, fiber optic transceivers, um, the progress are absolutely insane. It's probably one of those things that are progressing like crazy um, still just like you know, CPUs were progressing in the 80s or 90s. Um, 
just to give you an idea is that uh, with wavelength division multiplier, um, uh, multiplexing, sorry, uh, WDM, or space division multiplexing, SDM, um, now we can reach literally uh, a tenth of terabytes of data transferred per second on a single cable of, of optic fiber. This is absolutely enormous. I mean, we are, we are reaching the point where uh, a single cable can carry enough data to essentially feed an entire data center, and they are still, and what is even more impressive is that um, the, the telecom industry has even been able to develop new transceiver that can uh, deliver this, um, those absolutely crazy performance based on all cables. So you don't even have to deploy you know, in the streets or uh, uh, physically a new fiber. You can literally take the fiber that was deployed a decade ago and you deploy the new transceiver and you, uh, and you have uh, several orders of magnitude more bandwidth on the very same cable. Um, now, uh, the interesting thing is that there is a, a general law of optical uh, communication, which is every decade, um, the distance shrink at which it becomes interesting to replace electrical communication by optical communications. If we go a few decades back in the past, um, two decades ago, uh, it took something like probably about 100 meters for uh, the optical communication to surpass electrical communication. So if you had like very short, if you had distances that were shorter than 100 meters, you would go for copper. If you had uh, more than 100 meters, you would go for fiber. However, nowadays, um, latest generation, we can have a distance where the optical, the optics are winning even as short as three meters. And if I look, you know, uh, one um, decade ahead, I would not be surprised that we see situations where um, um, optical communications are winning, even if we are looking at distances that are as short as half a meter, which means that at some point, I'm, I, I would not be surprised if uh, computers themselves, just one computer, you had optical pathways inside your computers just because it's actually more performant than, uh, than electrical pathways. Um, from uh, an enterprise software perspective, that's something that is also very interesting because it means that if you're looking ahead, uh, bandwidth is going to decrease in cost massively. And by the way, the world affair is subsidized heavily by the Netflix of this world that have dramatic bandwidth consumption. Um, but that means that it will be able, uh, in order to cheat with latency, you could do things like grab tons of data preemptively toward the user and then let the user interact with data that has been brought closer to him with a much shorter latency, even if you bring data that is not needed. You see, what kills you is latency, not bandwidth. So it's better to say, oh, I, I, I have doubts about what sort of data will be needed. I can, you know, take a thousand times more data than uh, what I really need, just bring it closer to the end user, let the user or the, the, uh, the program interact with this data and minimize the round trip and I will be gaining in terms of performance. So that again has profound impact on um, the sort of architecture decisions that are made today because they will condition whether you can you know, uh, gain performance with the progress of, uh, of this class of hardware um, uh, a decade from now. In conclusion, latency is the big battle of our time in terms of, uh, of um, software engineering. This is really conditioning all the sort of performance that we have. Uh, and that will be, and, and performance uh, is absolutely key because performance will not only drive the IT cost, it will also drive the productivity of the people that operate in your supply chain. And ultimately, that will also drive the performance of the supply chain itself, because if you don't have this performance, you can't even implement the sort of numerical recipe that would really be smart and really be delivering the sort of, of advanced optimization, predictive optimization even, that you really seek. However, um, across the board, um, this battle of, of, of better performance is not being won, at least not in the circles of enterprise software new systems can be and frequently are slower than the old ones. This is really an acute problem. Those uh, slower software performance is really a feature. Um, slower software is going to generate 
um, staggering cost for the company that falls for it. And just to give you an example that it should be, it should not be considered as a given that better, better computing hardware gives you better performance. Uh, there was uh, some people on the internet decided to actually measure the input latency, so the input lag, which is basically the time it takes after a key press to get the corresponding letter to be displayed on the screen. With an Apple II in 1983, the time it took was 30 milliseconds, and that was with a one megahertz processor. And in 1916, with a Lenovo X1, uh, with a 2.6 gigahertz processor, which was really, uh, which is really, you know, a, a, a nice, uh, a nice notebook, uh, it turned out that the latency is 110 milliseconds. So we have uh, computing hardware that is several thousand times better, and yet we end up with a latency that is uh, almost four times slower. And that's very characteristic of what is happening when you're not paying, uh, when you don't have uh, mechanical sympathy, where you don't pay attention to the sort of hardware, computing hardware that you have. It turned out that uh, if, you, if you antagonize uh, the computing hardware, the computing hardware repay you in kind with a very crappy performance. Uh, and, and, and the problem is, is very real. So my, uh, my, my suggestion is when you start looking at any kind of piece of enterprise software for your company, and that can be open source software, you know, open source, as we have seen with the, the, the problems with the Linux kernel, it's not because it's open source that magically uh, the, uh, um, the performance problem disappears. Uh, if you start looking at a piece of, of tech for your company, you really need to think, to, to remember this sort of mechanical, elements of mechanical sympathy that you've gained today. Remember them and look at this piece of software and think hard on whether this piece of software is embracing those uh, deep trends of computing hardware or if they just ignore them altogether. Because if they ignore them altogether, it means that uh, not only the performance is not going to improve over time, but most likely it's going to get only worse. Because this sort of, uh, again, most of the programs that are being achieved nowadays are not through clock speed. They are doing through specialization. And if you, so if you, if you basically miss entirely this, uh, this highway, then uh, you're taking a path that is going to be slower and slower and slower over time. And those solutions should be really avoided because nothing, when you take a piece of software that antagonizes the, the hardware, it is usually the result of very early, uh, I would say, of, of key design decision that cannot be unmade ever. So you're stuck with them forever. And, uh, and it will only get worse year after year. So you have to think, you know, a decade ahead when you start looking at those angles. Okay, so let's have now a look at the question. That was a fairly long lecture. I'm sorry, but uh, it is a fairly difficult and challenging topic. A first question from uh, Pierre Garcia. Joannes, what is your opinion on quantum computers and their utility to tackle complex supply chain optimization problems? Ah, very, very interesting uh, question. I did, by the way, register for the beta um, uh, of IBM. IBM opened, um, that was, I think, 18 months ago, uh, a beta so that you could access their quantum computer in the cloud. Um, so my, my feeling, it is, uh, first, it is, uh, it is thrilling. It's, uh, it's one, when I told you, you know, that experts can see all the S curves plateauing, but you don't see the new curves appearing out of nowhere. Um, quantum computing is one of those. Now, um, I see that quantum computers present uh, very, very tough challenges as far as supply chains are concerned. First, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, the battle of our time in terms of enterprise software is latency. And quantum computers don't do anything about that. Uh, quantum computers gives you essentially um, uh, several, you know, even up to potentially, let's dream, 10 orders of magnitude of speed up for super tight uh, uh, compute problems. So that was the one where I said, you know, you can go from CPU to GPU to TPU. Well, com uh, I would say quantum computers would be the next stage beyond TPUs, where you, uh, where you can have a, a very super tight operation done incredibly fast. Um, 
this is very, very interesting, very, very interesting. But to be honest, right now, um, there are very, very few, to my knowledge, companies that are even managing to leverage super scalar instruction inside their, their pieces of enterprise software. So that means that the entire market is leaving on the table uh, a, a 10 to, um, to 20 x speed up that is super scalar instruction. <laughs> GPUs, <laughs> there is like nobody in the supply chain world that is uh, doing it, maybe low cap, maybe not. Uh, but anyway, uh, there are very, very, very few people. TPUs, I think there is literally nobody. Uh, Google is doing it extensively, but I'm not aware of anybody who has ever used TPUs for anything supply chain related. And, and, uh, and quantum processors would be the stage, the way I see it, beyond, uh, beyond TPUs. So um, I think I'm definitely very attentive to what is happening for quantum computers. But uh, I believe this, this is not the bottleneck that we face. It's, it's completely thrilling because we revisit essentially the von Neumann design that was established um, something like uh, essentially 70 years ago. But this is not the bottleneck that we face, or at least not the way I, I, I see it. And I believe this is not the bottleneck that supply chain will be facing you know, um, for the next decade. However, beyond that, well, uh, your guess is as good as mine. Yes, it could potentially change everything or not. Um, another question from uh, Vijaj Kumar Jadav. Cloud and SaaS offering are enabling organization to leverage uh, and convert fixed cost. Are the companies offering such services also working toward reducing their fixed cost and associated risk? Well, depends. Um, because you see, if uh, I am um, a cloud computing platform and I sell you processing power, is it really my interest to make your enterprise software as efficient as possible? Not really. I'm selling you, you know, what I'm selling you is essentially uh, virtual machines and gigabytes of bandwidth and drives. So actually, quite the opposite. My interest is to make sure that you have software that is as inefficient as possible so that you can consume, pay as you go, crazy amount of resources. So, uh, so the trick is um, internally, internally, com big tech companies, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, are incredibly you know, aggressive when it comes to the optimization of their uh, compu computing resources. But I they are incredibly aggressive as far they are on the front line to pay the bill. When, um, when they are charging you know, a client because they, they, they let a client rent a virtual machine, if the client is renting a virtual machine that is 10x uh, bigger than what it should be just because the piece of enterprise software that they are using is vastly inefficient, you know, it's not of their interest uh, to interrupt the client doing a mistake. This is just fine for them. It's, it's good business. And, and when you think about it, uh, and when you think that system integrators and, pla and cloud computing platforms tend to work hand, uh, I would say, uh, as, as partners, you can think that those categories of people don't necessarily have your best interest in mind. Now, uh, when it comes to SaaS, well, it's kind of different. Uh, indeed, SaaS, if you end up paying you know, a SaaS provider per user, then indeed it is uh, of the interest of the company, and that's the case, for example, full disclosure for LOCAD, uh, we don't charge by the computing, by the amount of, of cloud computing resources that, that we consume. We typically charge our clients according to flat monthly fees, that is just you know, a flat subscription. Um, that do not vary depending on the amount of, of, of uh, computing resources that we have. Thus, um, SaaS providers are, tend to be very, very aggressive when it comes to, um, to uh, their own consumption of, uh, of, of compute resources. But also, it means that there is, uh, beware, there is a bias, which is if you are a SaaS company, it means that um, you can be quite reluctant of doing something that would be much nicer for your client, but that would be much more costly in terms of hardware for yourself. You see, it's, it's not all, all good and rosy. It means that uh, there is a, a kind of a conflict of interest that impacts all uh, 
um, the SaaS providers that operate in the supply chain space, which is, uh, well, for example, they could invest uh, into re-engineering all their systems um, to deliver uh, better latency and you know, uh, pages, web pages that display faster. But the thing is that it costs resources and their clients are not necessarily going to pay them uh, more if they do that. And the problem tends to be un amplified when it comes to enterprise software. Why is that? It's because the person who buys the software is typically not the person who uses it. And that's why also why so, so much of the enterprise system is so incredibly slow. It's the guy or the person who is actually buying the software is not the one using it. So the one who buys the software do not suffer as much as a poor you know, demand planner or, uh, 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 or, or inventory manager who has to cope with a super slow system every single day of the year. Uh, so there is, again, this is another angle that is kind of specific to, um, to the, the, the realm of enterprise software. So you see, you really need to analyze the situation looking at all the incentives that are at play. And when, when we're dealing with enterprise software, there is usually plenty of conflicting incentives at play. Alexei Tikhanov, how many times LOCAD had, revisit, had to revisit its approach given uh, the process uh, in hardware observed. Can you mention an example, if possible, uh, to just put this uh, content in context of real problem solved? Um, so LOCAD, I believe, we did extensively um, re-engineer our technology stack about half a dozen times. However, um, LOCAD was founded in 2008, um, and, and we had like half a dozen of, of major rewrite of the war architecture. Uh, however, it's not because the software had uh, progressed that much. You know, the software had progressed, yes, but um, what drive most of our rewrites was not the fact that the, so the hardware had progressed that much. It was more like we had gained understanding uh, in, in the hardware. Everything that, has, that I've presented today um, was essentially known to, um, uh, to the people who were already paying attention a decade ago. So you see, there is, yes, again, as I was saying, our hardware is evolving, but this is, this is very slow, and most of the trends are very predictable even one decade ahead. Um, this is a long game being played. So LOCAD had to undergo massive rewrites but it was more the reflection that we were gradually less incompetent. We were gaining competency, and so we had better understanding on how to embrace hardware rather than, than the fact that the hardware had been changing that fast. I mean, it was not always true. There were specific elements that really were game-changing for, for us. Um, uh, for ex the most notable one was SSDs. We, we did a transition from uh, uh, HDD to SSD, and it was a complete game changer in our performance, and it had like massive impacts in uh, our architecture. In terms of very concrete example, well, um, literally, <clears throat> the whole design of um, uh, of Envision, you know, the domain-specific programming language that Locat provides, is based on those insights that we have gathered at the hardware level. And, and typically, you know, it's not, it's not like there is not one achievement. It's about doing everything that you can think of just faster. You want to process a table, you just want to be able to do it. One table, you know, a billion, uh, a billion lines, 100 columns. You just want to be able to do just that 100 times faster with the same computing resources. Can you do it? Well, yeah, uh, uh, and then you want to be able to do joints between tables that are very large with very minimal uh, computing resources. Can you do it? Yes, again. Um, can you have um, super complex dashboards with literally a uh, hundred tables that are on the dashboard that get displayed to the end user in less than 500 milliseconds? Yes, but we, we, we did achieve that. But you see, those are very mundane as achievements. Um, and then it's because we achieve all those mundane achievements that we can put fairly fancy um, uh, predictive optimization recipe in production because we need to make sure that all the, the, the steps that took us there are done with very, very high productivity. You see, the, the biggest challenge when you want to do uh, something very fancy 
for supply chain, you know, in terms of numerical recipes, it's not uh, the, the, the stage of maturity, it's not the make it work. Um, you can take college, college students and achieve a prototypes, uh, a fancy prototypes that will deliver some kind of supply chain performance improvement for your supply chain in a matter of weeks. Um, you just, you know, take Python, take whatever random uh, machine learning, open source machine learning library of the day, and they, those students, if they are smart and willing, uh, they will be achieving, you know, uh, uh, they will be uh, producing a working prototypes in a matter of weeks. However, you will never get that into production at scale. That's the problem. It's, it's how do you get through all those stages, those maturity stages of make it right, uh, make it fast, make it cheap. That's, that's where the hardware affinity really, really shine and your capacity to iterate. So there is no like absolute, uh, there is not like a one single achievement. However, um, everything that we do, for example, when we say LOCAD is doing probabilistic forecasting, probabilistic forecasting can be done with, uh, doesn't require that much processing, uh, processing power. What really requires processing power is to leverage very extensive distribution of probabilities and to look at all those possible futures and to combine all those possible futures with all the possible uh, decisions that you can take so that you can pick the best ones with the financial optimization. That gets very, very costly. And if you don't have something that is very optimized, you're stuck. Again, this is um, the, the very fact that Locat, for example, can use probabilistic forecasting in production is a testament that we had extensive uh, hardware level optimization all the way through the pipelines for literally all our clients. We are, we are serving about 100 companies nowadays. Pancash Nanani, is it better to have in-house server for enterprise uh, software, ERP, WMS, rather than using cloud servicing to avoid latency? I would say nowadays it doesn't matter. Uh, because you see, first, if if you have the possibility, you see, most of the latencies that you get are within the system. This is not the problem of the latency that you have between your user and the ERP. I mean, yes, if you have like a very crappy latency, you're going to add maybe um, uh, 50 milliseconds of latency. And obviously, if you have an ERP, you don't want to have your ERP sitting in Melbourne while uh, you are operating in, uh, in, uh, in Paris, for example. You know, you, you want to keep the data center close to where you're operating. But um, c modern cloud computing platforms have dozens of data centers. So there is not that much difference in terms of latency of having some kind of in-house hosting, because in-house hosting typically, it doesn't mean that you put the ERP on the floor in the middle of the factory or in the middle of the warehouse. Typically, when you say in-house hosting, it means that you're putting your ERP into a data center where you're just renting some uh, computing hardware. Um, so I, I believe that it doesn't really make any, uh, any practical difference from uh, the perspective of, um, of modern cloud computing platforms that have data centers all over the globe. Uh, no, uh, what really makes the difference is that do you have an ERP that internally minimize all the round trips? And for example, what is typically killing the performance on ERP is the interaction between the business logic and the relational database. If you have hundreds of back and forth for every, you know, to display a web page, if, if the ERP has to do hundreds of round trips between uh, the server that process the, the, the logic and the database, your ERP is going to be terribly slow. So you need to, to think of, um, of enterprise software designs that do not come with massive, uh, amount, with massive amount of round trips. But you see, this is something that is an inner property of um, the piece of enterprise software you're looking at. It doesn't very much depends on where you're locating um, the software. Alexei Tikhonov, another question. Do you think we need new programming languages? Oh, that's an easy question. Uh, that would embrace new hardware design at the core level using hardware architecture features to the full extent. Yes and yes. And that, by the way, but disclosure, I, I, I have a conflict of interest here. Uh, this is exactly what Locat has done with Envision. Um, uh, Envision was the idea that uh, it was born from the fact that we observed that um, it is tricky to leverage all this processing power that is available in modern computing, in, 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 in modern computers. But it should not be tricky. If you design 
uh, the programming language itself with performance in mind, you can make it supernatural. And that's why, you know, in, in the lecture, and that was, I believe, the lecture 1.4 about the, the programming paradigms for supply chain, I said if you pick the right pro programming paradigms, uh, for example, array programming or data frame programming, and you, you construct a programming language that really embraces those concepts, you get the performance for free. Um, obviously, I mean, almost for free. The price that you pay is that you're not as expressive as a, as a programming language as you could be in, let's say, uh, Python or C++. However, if you're willing to accept a reduced expressiveness, which can be kind of okay if um, you make sure that you cover all the use cases that are actually relevant for supply chain, then yes, you can, um, you can have massive uh, performance improvements. That's absolutely my belief. And um, that's why I also stated that, for example, uh, uh, object-oriented programming from um, the, the perspective of supply chain optimization, it brings nothing on the table. And quite on the contrary, this is a sort of paradigm that only antagonize the, uh, um, uh, the underlying computing hardware. I'm not, so, I'm not saying that uh, um, uh, object-oriented programming is all bad. This is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there are areas of uh, software engineering where it makes complete sense. Yet, it doesn't make sense for as far predictive, uh, as far as the predictive optimization of supply chain are concerned. So yes, very much, yes, we need, we need uh, um, programming languages that really embrace that. And I know that I tend to repeat you know, uh, the fact, but Python was essentially engineered in the late 80s, and they kind of missed everything there was to be seen about modern computers. You know, they have something where, uh, by design, they cannot leverage uh, multi-threading, they, they have this global lock, so they can't leverage the multiple cores, they can't uh, leverage locality, uh, they have late binding that really complicates uh, all the memory accesses, they, they, they are very verbose, so they, take, they consume a lot of memory, which means that it's going to play very, uh, um, very much against the cache, etc., etc., etc. So that's, that's the sort of problems where uh, um, it means that if you, if you do that with Python, well, it means that you're going to, to face uphill battles for the, the, the coming decades, and the battle will only get worse over time. They won't get any better. Excellent. So, um, so the, next, the next lecture will be um, three weeks from, from now. It will be same day of the week, same time of the day. So it's 3 p.m. Paris. It's going to be the 9th of June. And we are going to discuss modern algorithms for supply chain, which is kind of the counterpart of modern uh, computers for supply chain. See you next time.